With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Welcome in, everybody, and a happy Wednesday to you. Thank you for being with us on Tactics. And I still have been getting some problems with YouTube. And I hope this is live streaming because typically we, we broadcast on Facebook, on YouTube, on Periscope, and on Twitch. So if you are still having problems with the YouTube account, give me a, uh, just shoot me a message or something. But anyway, thank you so much for being with us. We do, of course, as always, appreciate all of you choosing to make us a part of your day, and we do thank you for that. Lots of local news that we need to get to today. First and foremost, Secretary of State John Merrill seems to be getting visually frustrated with people like Doug Jones and Terry Sewell, both representatives from Alabama, one being a representative in the House of Representatives, one being a senator. And they continue with this uh, line of attack on Republicans, saying that there is active attempts at voter suppression that is going on, that Republicans are trying to keep you from voting, that there are just these droves and droves of black people that are not able to vote because there are a bunch of evil, white, greedy, racist Republicans that are keeping them from voting. Now, how is that happening? We don't know. Where are all these black people? We have no idea. They can't point to a single example of it, which is something that John Merrill continues to point out. He was actually on one of our sister stations up in Huntsville, the Dell Jackson Show. And the other day he did a phone interview with Dell Jackson, and you could hear the exasperation in his voice. And frankly, I don't blame him. Because here's the thing. It's not like you have to take an, exactly a long road trip in your logic mobile, as it were, to be able to get to what they're accusing John Merrill of. Because if Doug Jones and Terry Sewell, both from the state of Alabama, are saying that there is a active and very effective conspiracy going on within the Republican Party to try to keep black people from voting, and that they are succeeding in this, which is the line of attack that they continue to use, and the Secretary of State, and keep in mind the State Department is the department in the state of Alabama that is in charge of elections, well, then you have to essentially be saying that John Merrill, who is the Secretary of State, his department is the one doing it, because there would be no other way for that to be accomplished. If you were a Republican, let's just say for a second that they existed in this, uh, in this scenario to help us play out what they're really saying. If you were a Republican and you wanted to keep black people from voting, well, there would only be one way to do that. You would have to have some kind of influence in the State Department, which would mean either Republicans are pulling the strings behind John Merrill or pulling the strings behind people directly under John Merrill, putting John Merrill in the position of not knowing what's going on within his, his own department and allowing widespread racial voter fraud taking place. That's what they're accusing him of, because logically there's no other way to suggest that Republicans are engaged in this unscrupulous behavior unless John Merrill is at the absolute best, a complete incompetent moron that doesn't know what's going on within his own State Department, or at worst, an evil racist that's trying to keep black people from voting. So yeah, I understand him getting frustrated. If you were seeing this constant line of attack, calling you a racist and suggesting that you want to keep black people in your own state, of which Alabama has a pretty large population, I mean, I'm sitting in a city right now that is 70% black. If you were in that position... If you were in John Merrill's position, you would understand why he would get frustrated at these constant attacks calling him a racist. I mean, in a, in a roundabout way, but it's not even in a very roundabout way. It's pretty direct. They may not be using his name specifically, but that's essentially what they're suggesting. And so they are suggesting that he's not only a really bad person with no morals and that hates black people, they're also suggesting that he's a criminal. Because any of the things that I just described to you would constitute criminal activity. 
I mean, unless, again, the only best case scenario for him, if this were true, and of course it's not, but if it were, is that I guess he's just grossly incompetent, didn't know anything about it, but he's really bad at his job. And so at the very least, they're saying that he's a horrible secretary of state for allowing this to go on, for allowing this to go on. At the very worst, what they're saying is he's a racist that hates black people and doesn't want them to be able to vote. And so this is the thing that I understand Merrill getting, you, you could tell in that interview, he got really upset about. And this is one of the things that he actually said in this interview to sort of uh, mount his defense. Since January 19th, 2015, we have registered 1,229,399 new voters. We now have a record uh, of 3,470,811 registered voters in Alabama. Man, I, that that is a lot of people in Alabama that are registered to vote. Again, it's about, it's just a little shy of 3.5 million. To give you some sense of how many voters we have in the state of Alabama, we have 4.88 million citizens. So 3.5 is pretty close to being the actual population of Alabama. So John Merrill has done an amazing job at getting new registers voted, uh, new voters registered. You look at what he's been able to do. He's saying, think about that. That is a massive increase in a short amount of time. That's since 2015 that he has gained 1.3 or 1.2 million new voters. And there's only 4.88 million people in the whole state. That's just about doubling the amount of voters that we had since 2015, four years. So by any measure, John Merrill, love him or hate him, like his politics, don't like his politics, you have to admit he's got a lot of new people registered in the state of Alabama, way more than we had before. It's not even close. I mean, statistically, unless... Something weird is happening. He's probably had more voters registered under his administration than any secretary of state in the history of Alabama. I can't say that for sure. I haven't looked at all of them. But with numbers like that, it would not be very hard to imagine if you're almost uh, if you're getting about a 50 percent increase from the amount of voters that when you came into office as opposed to today, it would <laughs> I very, very, very much doubt there is another secretary of state that has that unless something weird happened. But you have to keep in mind also, one of the lines of attack and one of the reasons that this has become a talking point for Democrats is because there was some federal oversight over Southern states that was taken out of effect because of the Civil Rights Act of 1965. Now there were two reasons, and when I say that there it was taken out of effect, I'm talking about literally, I think it's two sentences, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to look at the, the Civil Rights Act again, but. If I'm not mistaken, it's only two sentences in the entire bill that was taken out, and all that did was allow some extra oversight from the federal government on elections, and the intent behind that, even though I disagreed with it, uh, the intent behind that was to provide extra oversight to certain states but not others. And essentially the reason the court threw it out is because they said it was inherently discriminatory, which, by the way, it was. It meant states like Alabama and Georgia and Tennessee had to basically ask the federal government's permission to do any little thing to their elections, whereas other states, pretty much anywhere other than the Deep South, could do whatever they wanted to with impunity. That's really what was happening, and that's the reason that the court threw it out, and also part of the reason they did that is probably because this is no longer a problem, which is something that ought to be celebrated is that even in the Deep South, where there were things, uh, real voter suppression actually happening at one time back in the 60s before I was even born, that was happening back then. It should be something that should be celebrated by everyone that those measures are no longer needed. Because we've moved past the point where there are a large plurality of people that want to keep people of certain racial demographics from voting. Now, there's always going to be some random idiot that wants that, but the vast majority of Alabamians, the vast majority of, of Southerners in general, would not vote for somebody that was advocating for disenfranchising a certain group of people based on their race, even if it helped their party. I talk to a lot of Republicans. I talk to a lot of conservatives. I do not know a single one 
that would even consider voting for somebody if they were saying, well, what we want to do is we want to make it to where black people can't vote. None of them would. And because they realized that this was no longer a problem, that particular provision in the Civil Rights Act was no longer needed. That's something that ought to be celebrated by everybody that we came that far. But here's the thing that is really infuriating. Because of that, they have sort of tried to perpetuate this lie that disenfranchising voters is now legal. You can do it with impunity. It doesn't matter. And because of this, there's a lot of bad, evil, racist Republicans that are trying to keep people that aren't white from voting. There's absolutely not an ounce of truth to this. And unfortunately, Doug Jones and Terry Sewell continue to toe the party line and continue to repeat this lie, even though they know there's also not any proof to this. Now, I want you to think about this. And we've already hinted at this just a little bit. As of 2018, as of 2018, our state's population was approximately 4.88 million. And that's including kids and felons, people that can't vote, people under the age of 18, people that have had their voting rights removed because of a felony or something like that. Whether you agree with it or not, that's just the way that the numbers stack up. So, that means that roughly 90% of Alabama's voting age population is registered because if you take about 1.2 million out that aren't voting age, and keep in mind, that's not counting the felons. That means that whatever you take out would still include felons that also aren't able to vote. And I couldn't really find a, a, I couldn't find a statistic that was consistent across several different sources on that one. So we'll just take out the number of, of kids in Alabama, 1.2 million. That means that according to this number, if you're looking just at the adult population that's able to vote in the state of Alabama, and you look at the figure that John Merrill just gave, which, like I said, is just shy of 3.5 million, that means that a little bit over 90% of Alabama's adult population is able to vote. And considering that almost 25% of Alabama's population is black, that means there are an awful lot of black people voting. In fact, if you look at it statistically, since the year 2008, Black people have actually been voting more than white people per capita. So even though they're a smaller percentage of the population, they're actually overrepresented in elections. They actually tend to vote more than white people. They are more likely to cast votes than white people are. And so if you're looking at these numbers, the case that you can be made that there are just these large portions of black people that are no longer able to vote and it's Republicans that have put these policies in place that have tried to keep black people from voting, the numbers just do not come even anywhere close to showing that. I mean, you're looking at John Merrill's administration, over 90% of adults in the state of Alabama are registered to vote. And the ones that don't, don't want to. That's the thing that John Merrill has said. I've talked to him personally. I've known the guy for several years now, I think. And he's saying, well, you know, we do everything that we can to get people registered to vote. Some people just don't want to vote. But if you're still batting over 90%, that's pretty darn good. And I don't see how anybody can say that he's trying to disenfranchise voters with numbers like that. And... He also, in this same, this same uh, interview, one of the things that he brought up when talking about Doug Jones and Terry Sewell, he said, they have not been able to find one person that wanted to register to vote and wanted to vote in the polls, and because of some kind of law or policy or something that went on with them, was not able to do so. Now, maybe somebody thought that the polls closed at, at 9 and they actually closed at 7 or something like that. But he's talking about people that actually wanted to vote, that wanted to go to the polls. Nobody was turned away. There was no technicality that they – nobody has been disenfranchised. And Democrats continue to perpetuate this lie despite the fact that nobody calls them out on it, that nobody asks them about that. Nobody says, can you at least give me a story of one person that's been disenfranchised? Because it doesn't happen. They don't exist. And one of the things that Merrill brought up in this, he's saying, they can't give you one example. I can give you 1.2 million examples of people being able to vote that have registered since 2015. Yeah, the numbers are pretty stacked in Merrill's favor when you look at that. So here's the bottom line. 
if Republicans in the state of Alabama, this is true abroad, but especially with the numbers that we've looked at in the state of Alabama, if Republicans are trying to keep black people from voting, they are doing a terrible job. They are woefully incompetent at doing what they're trying to do if they're really trying to keep black people from voting because they can't even stop one person, apparently. They can't find one example of one black person that wanted to vote and followed the rules and got registered in time and still wasn't able to vote. Because it's not happening. And they continue to call back to this sort of phantom boogeyman of voter suppression, even though there's no proof that it's actually happening. So then the question becomes, why do they keep saying it? If there's no truth to it, and it's so easily disprovable, why do they continue saying it? Why do Doug Jones and Terry Sewell insist that this is happening, even though it's very clear that it is not? Well, the truth is, it gets people to the polls. It does. It is an issue that gets people to the polls. It's kind of that reverse psychology thing where people tell you not to do something, and because you think that someone's trying to keep you from doing something, you do it anyway. I'm sure all of us that have been teenagers have experienced this at one point or another, that once your parents tell you not to do something, there's nothing you want to do more than the thing that they told you not to do. And it may even be that you want to do it specifically because they told you that you can't do it, not even so much because you actually want to engage in the activity. And so that's part of it. There is a, a, a part of it that's that factor, the sort of rebellious factor that, man, there's a bunch of bad Republicans that don't want me to vote. Well, I'll show them. I'll vote anyway. So that's part of it. And another thing, too, that the people that they are talking to specifically tend to come out and vote for Democrats, because if you're telling them that not only that there are some people that don't want you to vote, you can vote those people, those bad people that don't want you to vote out of office. Well, who do you think they go to the polls and vote for? They don't vote for Republicans. They vote for Democrats. That's what happens because they believe that the Republicans are the ones trying to keep them from voting. So they specifically go and they want to vote for the Democrats. And if you don't believe this is happening, because honestly, I tend to be very optimistic on certain things and I have a lot of faith in people. And because of that, I try to give the benefit of the doubt, probably sometimes when I really shouldn't. But this is one particular scenario where I can honestly say that this is something that would get me in trouble. And I had my eyes opened uh, in part because I was on Kevin's show. And, you know, Kevin is somebody that actually agrees with me on this. He and I see eye to eye on this issue, but he has quite a few callers that do not. He has quite a few callers that genuinely believe that there is this widespread voter suppression. And what's hilarious is that Doug Jones continues to say this, despite the fact that he was elected primarily by a groundswell of black voters. That's what the numbers showed in the wake of his victory over Roy Moore, that black people came out in gigantic, unprecedented numbers to vote for him, and yet he still continues the lie that black people are not being able to vote, even though he is literally walking proof that black people are able to vote, including in states like Alabama and the Deep South. And so it's hilarious that him even being in his position is proof that what he's saying is complete and utter nonsense. But nonetheless, he continues on this line of attack. And the thing is, this message works. Like I said, I don't know how many callers would call in and swear up and down that this voter suppression was happening. And then I'd ask them, can you give me one example of it? Can you, do you know a person that tried to vote and couldn't vote? Do you know anybody that is trying to register to vote and they can't for whatever reason? I mean, unless they're a felon or something. And they never could provide any evidence, no evidence whatsoever, none, none of them. And yet they continue to believe it. That's the thing. They want to believe it, so they do. They don't need evidence. They just want to believe that they are being victimized in some way. And because of that, they see an opportunity to do that, and so they grab onto it. They believe it despite not having any reason to believe in it. So unfortunately, even though it's wrong and it's immoral and it's certainly not an honorable thing to do, the Democrats are going to continue with this line of attack specifically because they know it works for them they know it's effective and they know that people believe it, even if it's completely wrong. And the bottom line here is that it's wrong when Democrats fearmonger to try to get votes and it's wrong when Republicans do it. And yes, Republicans do it. And I try to call them out when that takes place. In fact, it just so happens that before I even read this story or knew that I was going to cover it, 
I saw something else that I wanted to cover the other night uh, on the internet. I saw a meme that's been going around. And so it is time yet again for another edition of Breaking the Internet. I didn't touch anything, I swear! Oh, Ty, what did you do? It wasn't my fault. Okay, so for today's edition of Breaking the Internet, I did want to go ahead and show you this graphic. This was the meme that I was talking about. And for those of you that, that don't have the visual that are just listening, it says, please read, in 20 years, there will be enough Muslim voters in the U.S. to elect the president. I think everyone in the U.S. should be required to read this. But with the ACLU, there is no way this will be widely publicized unless each of us sends it on. This is your chance to make the difference. All right, so we're going to real quickly go through this. First of all, I agree that this is an area of concern. We've seen that having a, a, at least a couple of Muslim representatives in office has not gone well in Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. That doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any Muslims that wouldn't be good candidates, but it's very clear to see that they are not. And also, there are extreme radical Muslims that believe that going into a country infiltrating it and having lots and lots of children, sometimes even through violence and rape, are acceptable forms of jihad. Now, again, this is only the very radical extremist Muslims, but those people do exist. And see, that's what makes it so dangerous is because it's only the most radical and most extreme that would use this policy, which would mean the radical Muslims would be producing far faster than the kind and, and you know, the Muslims that wouldn't necessarily be a problem. So I agree with the overall sentiment of this meme that this is something that we should be concerned about, that the growing Muslim population in this country has had detrimental effects on, on us. And I mean, look at our friends across the pond, several different countries that allowed large populations of Muslim refugees in had a lot of problems with law enforcement in the following years in France and England. We've seen this over and over again, so I'm not saying this isn't a legitimate concern. But the question is, is it true? The question is, is the central claim of this meme, this graphic, that in 20 years there will be enough Muslims to elect a president by themselves, is that actually true? Well, I crunched some numbers, and we'll go to the phones, as because uh, I see there's a caller online. I, we'll go to the phones as soon as I'm done with this. Let's look, is this actually factually accurate? So just to give you a little context, there's 3.27 million people in the United States and about 3.5 million Muslims. So a pretty small sliver of the population. All right, let's take out all the kids because again, you have to be of majority age. You have to be 18 to be able to vote. So that leaves about uh, 249 million people. And assuming that the rate of children is going to be close to that, close to the same as it is in the general population, which by the way, it probably isn't, but we'll give them the benefit of the doubt here and just assume that it's roughly the same as the general population. So we can assume that there's roughly 2.6 million Muslims after you remove the children. And since it takes two to tango, in other words, obviously it takes two people to create a baby, regardless of what liberal scientists will tell you, <laughs> uh, it does take a, it does take a, a man and a woman to create a child. And so after that, you have to half that and assume that the population is roughly half women and half men. So that brings us down to roughly 1.3 million Muslim couples. All right. So according to this, based on the last election, you would need about 69 million votes to win an election. Give it a take a little bit. And of course, the Electoral College would also be a hindrance to this because there are certain areas of the country with a very high Muslim population. And so the Electoral College would actually stymie that even if they had enough to win the popular vote that they would have to have them in the right states. So if you take that out of consideration, again, give them every benefit of the doubt that we can on this, that leaves you with about 69 million votes to elect a president. So if that's true, each Muslim couple would need to have about 53 children apiece for this to be accurate. But wait, it gets even better. Keep in mind, to be able to vote, you have to be 18. You can't vote if you're under 18, which means that they only have two years to produce the 53 children per couple to become the majority in this country. 
So, I mean, this is just blatantly stupid, not even to become the majority, just to become the majority voting block. And all of that is assuming that there is not one new voter of any other religion that comes along to cancel it out. So the other numbers would have to remain completely stagnant for 20 years for this to be true, which obviously is not going to happen. So I did this just to point out it's wrong when Republicans fear monger about votes like this, and it's wrong when Democrats do it. If we're going to have a discussion about votes and voter disenfranchisement or whatever, we have to have an honest conversation. We have to have it that's actually based on facts or else we're just yelling and screaming at each other. All right, let's go to the phones. Good afternoon. What's your name? Hey, John. I just wanted to give a testimonial on your prior, your prior uh, point. Yeah, go ahead. About, about voter suppression. Mm-hmm. I voted twice when President Obama was running. And I can assure you... Not in the same election, a, though. No. But <laughs> in both times when he ran, right, and he was the candidate for the Democrat Party for president, I can assure you that there was absolutely zero suppression in Millbrook, Alabama. Because there was a line as long as, you know, going out to the parking lot toward the park out there. Mm. And people don't know where that is. They could tell where I voted. But there wasn't any there. And to your point earlier about those that that uh, have been proponents of this idea mm-hmm. that there's voter suppression all over the place, you don't see any interviews. You don't see any lawsuits. Nope. You don't see anything like that. You don't see anyone with a lawyer that can prove that the suppression took place. I haven't seen it. If they have, they you have to believe that they would be on CNN, MSNBC, even Fox, where the voter suppression took place. Well, Dad, but it just isn't on there. I, I haven't. Maybe I missed it somewhere. They say in Georgia there was all kinds of voter suppression with the last governor's election, but I haven't heard of anybody specifically that was suppressed. Well, that's the thing, and and that story that you're talking about, I remember covering that. It wound up to be a giant pot of nothing, but think about how much attention that got. Think about how much time the national news media spent on that story. And why did they spend so much so much time on it, even though it didn't take a whole lot of research to find out that there was nothing to it and there was no voter suppression going on? It's because they don't have real stories of voter suppression, so they have to latch on to the ones that are made up. Right. There is, it, to put it in economic terms, there is a far shorter supply of voter suppression stories than there is demand for it. The national media would love nothing more than to run all these stories about voters, especially minority voters, being disenfranchised, but it's just not happening. And that's the problem that they're running into is they're constantly trying to push this narrative, but there's never any evidence to back it up. Well, see, one of the problems with this is with regard to conservatives who ultimately all the suppression uh, is it's implied that conservatives and Republicans are the ones that do all the suppression. Oh, yeah. And, and all the corruption, there can't be possibly any on the other side. What they don't know is, they don't know the mindset of what would be called their enemy. Even if we lose, if they have more votes, we live with it. That's just the way we are. Yep. Uh, no matter how it turns out, even if it isn't on our side, even if things don't go our way, we just live with it. You think about those that have won in the past that were Democrats, and you didn't hear a peep. Out of anyone that, you know, uh, they were were touting this in newspapers and on television and on things like that, saying that the election was a was a cheat. Now you had some people saying that he wasn't a legal president because he wasn't born here. Right. But and, other than that, and that was incorrect. Anything about and that was incorrect too. But, but you didn't you didn't have this idea that that people were being suppressed and and uh, that kind of thing. We blamed ourselves and said we just didn't get the vote out. Yeah. And and that's true. And unfortunately, there are some, like I said, there are some Republicans that do fear monger about votes. And unfortunately, the president right now, Donald Trump, did push this narrative a little bit. He said that the reason that he lost the popular vote is because there were large swaths of illegal immigrants that were able to vote. And there was some voter fraud. We have video evidence of it. Those cases yeah. have been put under the microscope, but nowhere near to the levels that it would cause a an actual change in the outcome of the election. And you're right, as a general rule, 
when their guy loses, Republicans tend to say, well, we got to do better next time. We don't like the fact that they won, obviously, but we don't accuse the other side of cheating. I have heard progressives champion uh, and say that those that are not citizens of the country should be able to vote. I've right. heard that myself. Yeah, they've they've said that. They haven't been able to figure out a way to actually get it done, but they have been uh, proponents of that. In, and there are even cities in California now where— so That's blatant they, cheating and saying it up front that that's what they want to do, regardless right. of what the law says. So right. who do you think is more apt to cheat or and suppress them or the side of the conservatives? No, I agree with you, and and I genuinely believe that if I don't know about the rank and file Democrat voter, but you're right, especially the thought leaders, especially the people up at the national level and Democrats that are in office, a lot of them have been very vocal about the fact that they'd love to have non-citizens voting. Sure, and that is completely. I mean, and if they had it set up the way they wanted, and I've made this, uh, I've said this before. It seems like now I could be proven wrong, mm. but I think if they could get away with it, they would set up voting machines in Mexico. And just let them vote down there and let that be a part of it, too. There's some of them that if they they thought it would let them win, they would. Yeah. I wouldn't say all of them, but there would be some. No, but I'll tell you this. The general idea is to one day have one country in the whole world anyway. Right. Which is what they're aspiring to. Well, see, that's the thing. I don't want to vote for who's in the House of Lords or who's in Parliament in England. I don't want to decide who gets to, right. I don't care who's the president of France. Like that's not Mm -hmm. my business. I don't live there. Yeah. I don't, as long as they don't fight us or uh, cause any harm to us, I don't care what they do. Yeah. Same here. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts. I appreciate it. All right. And uh, I actually did have a couple other things scheduled for today, but it is getting very close to six o'clock. And as you know, it's Wednesday. We have a little bit shorter show on Wednesday because I have to get to Bible study. So I guess we'll just go ahead and go straight to The Chaplain's Report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Chaplain's Report today, for those of you who have been longtime fans of this program and have been following me for a while, you may remember that we actually started on a series in the book of Daniel, and because I had to leave the show and and take a leave of absence for almost a whole month, in fact, it may have been a month, because of that, we never finished the series that we started on the book of Daniel. And so I thought it would be good to go ahead and start that back up. And and we may take a couple of breaks if I think that there's a Bible verse that's especially pertinent for the story that we're covering. But I wanted to go back to Daniel. And just to give a quick recap, because it's been a while since we covered this topic, where we were in the book of Daniel is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends, and Daniel's not in this story. We're not really sure why. It's just the way that it is. They have been put in a position of power and influence. They have been put in a position where they have some level of authority and some level of say with the king. And because of this, there are certain people that do not like them, that have it out for them, and the king has this vision, and he decides to create an idol. And he commands that whenever the idol is brought up and the music starts playing, everybody has to bow down and worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are Jews. They worship one God. They don't believe in idols. And because of that, they say no. And then the people that have it out for them that really are envious of them and want their job, they go tattle on them with the king and say, hey, these guys, they didn't worship or bow down or anything when the music started. And the king, I'm sure in his mind, was being very generous and and very forgiving and saying, okay, I'll give you another chance. Just the next time that it happens, then you need to worship the idol and and they say no we're not going to do that we you know we, we're not trying to cause a problem but we don't worship your gods we worship our god and nobody else and so this whole thing takes place and as punishment for refusing to worship an idol they're of course cast into the fiery furnace 
And this furnace is incredibly hot. It's seven times hotter than it normally was, and it was so hot, and the flames were so intense, it consumed the people that threw them into the furnace. And yet, when the king and his men look inside the furnace, still blazing, there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and somebody else. Could be an angel, could be Christ. We don't really know. The Bible's not very descriptive on that. But regardless, somebody was in there protecting them. Someone who was from God was there making sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were fine. And so we're going to go ahead and read sort of the fallout and the response to this in Daniel 3, 26 and 27. And it reads, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace blazing f of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the perfects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair on their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. The reason I think this is so important is because Nebuchadnezzar now understands who's really in charge. He didn't understand it before. After seeing this miracle, he definitely understands now. Now, does that mean that he understands everything, that God is the only God? It doesn't seem to be. In fact, he refers to him as the Most High God, which could mean that he believes that their God is the only God, but considering we see very different behavior from him later in this same book, probably not. He's probably still a pagan. He probably still thinks that there are lots of gods and, and their God is one of many. But now he knows that even if he believes in other gods, that their God is the Most High God, and he sees a very visual display of God's power, and that really does change the way he sees the world. And you may recall, if you go back a little bit earlier in this same book, right before he throws them into the furnace, when he's sort of having this conversation with them about why they refuse to worship, he says specifically, what God is there that can deliver you? And this gives us a lot of insight into Nebuchadnezzar and his worldview. See, this is not a man who's an atheist. He's a pagan. He believes in lots of gods. And yet even he is looking at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and saying to them, are you really suggesting that there even is a God that exists that is powerful enough to keep me from punishing you? See, he's not just suggesting that a God of some kind won't do it. He's saying there is not a God in existence that is more powerful than me. That's what he's saying because he's saying there aren't other gods that have the ability to deliver you from my wrath. Nebuchadnezzar has essentially made himself more powerful than any god that he believes in. And notice how in this episode, they don't merely survive. They are completely untouched. The way that the Bible describes it, and it's very descriptive and it's very specific. The hair on their head wasn't singed. Their clothes weren't harmed. So not only did God grant them some kind of temporary immunity to the fire and that their clothes burned off, but they were fine. No, no, their clothes were fine. They didn't even smell like fire when they came out. So to put this in terms of a big victory, this wasn't just God sort of saving them with the power that he had and using everything he's got. This is something that is a trifle for God, barely a passing thought. To put it into sports terms, since we're all talking about the NCAA tournament right now, this isn't like God wins by 20 points. This is like God wins 500 to zero, the other team doesn't even score a goal. And so this shows God's power not only in a way that he has the ability to deliver them, but he has the ability to do far greater than that. And so this is a feat that really puts God's power on display. They're not merely survived, they actually are completely untouched and unaffected by the fire. So it's not only that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't have power over their life or their death, 
it really kind of shows that he doesn't have power over them at all. When he's talking about servants of God, he can't just harm them. He can't even burn their clothes. That's how powerless Nebuchadnezzar is in comparison to God. And I think that the lesson that it really brings to us is that God can bring us through fires in the same way. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he allows us to feel the effects of the flame. Sometimes he allows us to go through very difficult situations in our life. And I'm sure in the life of these three men, it wasn't much different. I'm sure that in the lives of these three men, they went through several things that were very difficult for them. God didn't deliver them untouched through everything, but the point is that he can. And there are times when he does, probably times when we don't even realize it ourselves, that God brings us through an ordeal that really should have broken us, and we come out completely untouched, unaffected, not even smelling like fire. And so because of that, I think that it is a testament to God's power in the way that he works in our lives. And what was the effect of that? The effect of that is you had a man that was a pagan that didn't believe that there was even the possibility of a God that existed powerful enough to stop him from doing what he wanted to realizing, oh, I don't have any power compared to this God. Compared to the power that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have, I'm nothing. And once he realized that, it changed his attitude and it changed the way he saw them and changed the way he saw himself. And that's exactly what God does with the fires of our lives. When there's something very difficult that we have to go through, we may not even realize it, but God brings us out either completely unfazed or untouched, and we don't even realize why that happened. Maybe it was because God was trying to show somebody else, somebody that we weren't expecting, his power. That he's saying, because this is my servant, I did this great thing for them. And that acts as a testimony to other people. And even though I certainly didn't escape unscathed, this is kind of the way that I feel with what happened through my cancer treatment. I mean, the doctors and the people around me were astounded at how quickly I recovered and how fast the chemo worked. And frankly, so was I. I didn't expect it to be that quick. It was far easier than I ever thought it was going to be. And I think a lot of that was because there were other people around that saw that, and, and maybe that affected their lives too. I don't know that for sure. Maybe I'll never know, or at least not until I get to, to ask God about it personally. But the point is, sometimes God brings us through those fires so that he can affect the life of another person to teach us a lesson, but also to teach those around us about his power and his great love for those who live according to his will. And these fires can be in the form of sickness, in the form of losing somebody, or just going through something really difficult personally in your life. But the point is, God has the power to deliver you from the fire, just like he delivered them. Because all throughout the biblical narrative, God really only uses his power for two reasons. To protect people, to care for them in some way, whether it's through, like in here, physical danger, sickness, spiritual woes, whatever. He uses his power to do that. And he also uses his power as a teaching mechanism. And he almost always uses it at the same time for both of these situations. He almost always uses it for both of those purposes. And we see that over and over again in the biblical narrative. So when you're going through something, whether you come through completely unfazed or whether you have to take some licks, but God still delivers you through that situation, remember that it's for your benefit, but it's also for the benefit of those around you in a way that you may never understand how impactful that was to another person's soul and their relationship to God. Because God can bring us through the fires for our sake and for the sake of those that are watching. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalrada Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.